So uh, now let's introduce our three presenters for today. The first one is Elizabeth Cloud. She's a recipient of the Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship uh, funded by the European Union. And she's affiliated with the Faculty of Education and Culture and um, and um, uh, sorry, the, the Faculty of Education and Culture and the gamification group at uh, Tampere University in Finland. Um, her research specializes in studying self-regulated learning as a non-linear dynamical system uh, with educational technologies. And her focus is on collecting, processing, and analyzing multimodal data. This means eye movement, log files, um, physiology, facial expressions of emotions, um, to study the complex nature of learning and emotions across activities that build adaptive intelligence systems, to build adaptive intelligence systems. Um, our second speaker is um, Jelena Jovanovic. She's a professor at the Department of Software Engineering at the University of Belgrade in Serbia. She's also an adjunct professor in the Center for the Science of Learning and Technology, SLATE, at the University of Bergen in Norway and an adjunct professor in the Center for Learning Analytics at Monash, uh, at Monash University in Australia. Her research focus is on the use of computational approaches, including statistical and machine learning methods and techniques, network analysis and text analytics towards better understanding and supporting learning, primarily self-regulated uh, self learning in higher education settings. And our third speaker is Alexandra Poket or Sasha Poket. She's a tenure track professor in learning analytics at the School of Social Sciences and Technology at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. She's also an affiliate um, of the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning at the University of South Australia. Um, in, in Munich, she leads the uh, LEAPS research group that studies learning analytics and practices in systems. And her current research focuses on creating impactful technology-based interventions that use learning analytics and support agency and social networks in higher education and workplace training. The topic of today's work uh, seminar is um, uh, theoretical underpinnings and methodological um, toolkit and a methodological toolkit of complex dynamical, dynamical systems and our speakers will highlight their relevance to and potential integration with learning analytics. Thank you for being here today and sharing your research with us. Um, I now give the floor to you. Sasha, you will be sharing your screen first. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for the introduction. Please allow me a moment to set the right screen in motion. Um, and you should see my screen. Okay. Um, and uh, just bear with me another second and we can start. So, okay. Well, wonderful to see you all. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's an honor for us to be here. And we want to thank uh, Solar for inviting us to talk about complex dynamical systems and learning analytics. Um, my name is Alexandra or Sasha Poké, and I'm a professor at the Technical University of Munich doing this talk together with two of my colleagues. I'm just going to ask them to wave their hands because they talk later. So Liz Cloud just then, then was Jelena Jovanovic. Thank you very much to you both. So before we start, and I'd like to start given that um, time is running for us, we want to say that the arguments about the relevance of complex dynamical systems to learning sciences are not new and are not new to us uh, for sure. Uh, Kapoor's work is a stellar example of integrating complex systems into the analysis of learning. DeMello's research has set consistent flavor of complex dynamical systems thinking. Jacobson, Ryman, and Marcos Keiter offer ways of seeing complex systems as a meta theory over the cognitive and situated divide. Davis and Sumatra summarized some of this thinking in their 2006 book, and important work has been published in the International Journal of Complexity in Education. We must mention in this intro an excellent piece by Hilbert and Marshan that summarizes principles of CDS for educational psychology, and recent work on this by Hilbert, Bernacki, and Green. We also must talk about people whose research relates to complex systems in learning analytics, such as Kito and Gibson with their latest lag paper on interventions, Dinder and Cloud with work on effect and collaborative groups, 
Allen with work on comprehension and text, Deva Weidbuch and Azevedo with work in self-regulated learning, Lopez Pernas and Sacker with ideographic approaches in learning analytics, and Nixon with modeling com collaboration as a complex system. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, of course, of people who are looking at how to integrate complex systems in learning analytics or learning sciences. But at least here, the hope is to demonstrate that pockets of complex systems work have existed for a while. Now, for the three of us, what brings us here is the fascination with these ideas. So uh, we wrote some papers on this, one of them being the best paper at LAC last year, which is why we were invited to talk about it. Thank you. And also um, more recent work uh, last March, well, last March, past month, uh, where we had the first workshop on complex dynamical systems and learning analytics uh, that uh, we organized. Now, moving to the talk today, we will offer only one possible definition of a complex dynamical system to try and bring everybody on board um, with one example. And then I will explain just one theoretical idea from complex systems and that of a phase space to scaffold your understanding of the two examples of how these ideas can be used that Yelena and Liz will present to you. And I also want to say a few words. Of I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. The screen is flickering for us and it doesn't seem to be stopping. Could you just stop and share the screen again? Yep, absolutely. Just... Absolutely. Um, how early did you lose me? No, no, we heard everything. It's just that the screen is um, flickering. Okay. We see everything is just... How is this? No, I think it's still flickering. But um, right. I am not sure why. Hmm. But I guess, yeah, we'll have to continue like this for now, I think. Now it's well, the only th it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's use this and see how uh, this um, goes. Please stop me if this is not making sense. So um, to go back to what I was saying was that there's a huge body of work, um, actually, uh, both theoretical and methodological in complex systems research in relation to learning. And we will only pick one idea that we will try to unpack and exemplify for you. But importantly, um, this is just one idea and the range of other both theoretical and methodological application is much broader than what we'll talk about. And also we will not talk about causality because causality has a very special understanding in complex systems. Change of slide, hopefully, and some words of credit. Uh, so I will, um, I, I, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the resources that we used in being inspired of how to explain this better. And, um, so uh, the explanations uh, stem from the work by Johannes Jäger and Thurner and colleagues. So now moving on to the content of the talk. Uh, how do we define a complex dynamical system? Complex systems theory itself is an evolving area of science and the description of complex systems come from physics and biology and social sciences. And you can see some words here in the slide, but this is just to show a range of theoretical complexity that exists. And of course, because of that, the definitions that exist as to what a system is are many. But I think the useful one is starting from the point that defining a system that is a part that comprises of components that interact and produce some properties, is defining a system means setting it apart from its environment. So the example, um, a toy example here, let's imagine that all public knowledge and learning analytics can be viewed as a system. So that's the system on the right. And we are separating it by defining it that way from the environment. So the public knowledge in learning science and educational research on the left. The system of public knowledge in learning analytics can be represented as a network. And I work a lot with networks. So here's my network slide here. Um, this is a system where you see uh, each node is paper in luck. Uh, color is the topic of the paper. Connections are how these papers cite each other. We can say that this is a system of knowledge publicly available and uh, sort of prominent themes in this domain. Uh, we can describe this system at the macro level by saying there are emergent themes and trends and sort of important methodological considerations. We can also describe this system at the micro level uh, by looking at how individual papers cite each other and which section by which authors at which point in time, et cetera, et cetera. 
And we also know from complex systems theory that micro level processes, so these micro level work drives what we observe at a macro level of the system. And that once the macro level sets, so for instance, once we have themes and rules of what sort of is acceptable within this public space, then the micro level behavior will be constrained by that macro level process. And we also know from complex theory that these kind of systems, they have feedback loops uh, that take place between the different components uh, of the system as this uh, sort of system develops, in this case, as the scientific discourse uh, evolves. Now, if you were listening to me, you probably heard that there is a little bit of a discrepancy between what I say and what I show. My language has a lot of the movement and evolution and development, while the image itself only shows a static view of the system. The image, like the one I showed you, is limited in showing what the system does. And so to understand what the system does, we need to integrate time into this picture. Complex systems are assumed to have memory and to be path dependent. And that means that the history of behavior of a system affects its future behavior. And it also is assumed that these systems act and change through time. Characteristics of these changes may have a stable pattern and this pattern can be used to describe what the system does. And so, with this thinking about time and how to bring it into the definition, uh, I suggest to use for the modeling purposes, the definition by Johannes Jäger, who argues that for modeling a system, a complex system can be defined as a patterned process. And if we define a system as a patterned process rather than a thing, then we presume that there is a pattern of what this system does and that this pattern can be observed at a macro level where we need fewer or where we need less information to describe that uh, pattern of behavior. And that this pattern can be observed at a micro level, but there we need a lot more information. There's a lot more complexity as to what's happening. But importantly, it means that we then define a system as to what it does rather than what it is, again, for modeling purposes. And so to explain how to model what a system does through time, I will introduce this idea of a phase space of a system. Again, this is just one idea from the complex system repertoire, and we chose this one in order to explain the theoretical assumptions behind the examples that will be presented later in the talk. So first, let's talk about the landscape as the metaphor for development and a system's trajectory through it. Developmental trajectory refers to the trajectory of the past that the system takes to move through the space of all possible behaviors it can have. So I use the seminal metaphor from epigenetics here on the slide. The landscape, such as on the left, is the metaphor for all possible places where the ball can roll on and the ball represents a system. The shape of the landscape is constrained by forces or specific perturbations, as illustrated by the image on the right of the underbelly of the landscape. Now, going back to my example about the public knowledge of learning analytics, if we capture the position of the system of public knowledge creation uh, in 2011, then we can just put the red ball so where the system is, that entire system of knowledge in 2011. Um, and we can continue adding um, information about where that system is in other years. So yellow ball represents the same system in 2013. Blue ball represents the same system in 20, oh, 2014, right? And so you see the trajectory of knowledge production process captured on the landscape. This is still a metaphor, we're not talking modeling. If we continue adding time points when our system is um, captured, so in different years, uh, we can over time um, look at how this trajectory unfolds on the landscape of all possibilities. So the past of how the ball, this specific system has evolved um, is called the developmental trajectory. And here time means color, um, well, color means time. And the position of a system at on this landscape at any given moment represents the state of a system at that moment. Um, 
And we can see that right now, where it is in purple, um, it can go because of the shape of this landscape, because of the way this uh, these possibilities are constrained by some other forces. It can either go right or left, for instance, or anywhere within those uh, possibilities. Um, but also besides these states, so the momentary measures on the landscape, we can talk about phases and phases describe the state of the system qualitatively and they differ from each other. So for instance, in 2011, maybe knowledge creation where the red ball was best described by building on educational technology, literature and types of data that come exclusively from digital learning. So log data, for instance, right? But maybe if we want to describe qualitatively where the ball or the system of knowledge is in 2019, it can be described in completely different qualitative terms, such as inspired by HCI literature and participatory design, or characterized by the diversity of data used. And maybe although the state of the system, so the momentary measures uh, for yellow, blue, and orange balls are kind of differ, different uh, quantitatively, but they share the same qualitative properties. So the domination, for instance, of uh, methodological questions over questions about theory, theory of learning, um, or maybe the use of log data uh, with just a few examples of multimodal data. So this is just a pure example to try and illustrate a few simple ideas, well, not so simple, but a few are useful ideas, let's call it that way. First is this developmental trajectory, then is the state of a system at a given time, and third is the phases that describe multiple related states of the system. And I hope that the images went through correctly because it sort of summarizes the uh, notion of, of what I'm trying to say. And then the question is, okay, well, this is a nice metaphor, Sasha, thank you very much, but how do we move from there to modeling this, um, what this system does, or put it another way, how do we move from the metaphor to modeling this patterned process of knowledge creation? Well, in technical terms, a landscape as a, develop, as a metaphor for development can be formalized as a function of multiple variables. So here's an example of a space that's created by three variables at different time points. And uh, just hypothetically, for the sake of example, let's imagine that I can explain the state of learning analytic knowledge at a given point in time by three variables like presented here, number of citations to learn in science literature in that year, diversity of data types reported in that year, and number of citations to computer science and statistics in that year. You should already be thinking, well, how did she pick these variables? Well, yes, it is a little bit arbitrary in my case, but if you're really modeling something in relation to learning, that it's a, a non-trivial process of variable selection in relation to an analytical purpose or a given theory. But here we continue my metaphor. So I have these three variables in a space, and and I measure these three variables at a point in time in 2011 and 2019, which allows me to position where the, my system, the state of knowledge, uh, knowledge creation, is located in relation to all possibilities. And now, if I want to understand complex system as this pattern process of what the system does on this map, then I can ask questions, well, what are the regularities and how my system moves through this landscape? And so to demonstrate this idea, I'm changing the example slightly. So instead of considering all learning analytics papers, let's just consider my paper. So some my knowledge production process. So these are the papers. Each paper is can be characterized by this learning science citation, computer science, science citations, and diver, diversity of data used. And I'm mapping my papers over time on this landscape. And um, you can see that my first paper may be yellow, is defined by particular characteristics, second is still yellow, and third is the same, but fourth paper starts changing, seventh paper is in a completely different place, and then maybe my papers still oscillate back to the type of papers I was writing as I was in the beginning. Of course, all of this can be represented as time series rather than mapped on the three-dimensional space. And in this case, we will see a lot of variance from momentary measures uh, at a time series level, at a micro level, and we will see a lot less uh, sort of variance uh, at the level of qualitative descriptions. And that brings us forward to analysis of these patterns in the phase space and system states. So there's one important assumption that exists when we talk about phase space of a complex system, and that is the dynamics of the system can be reconstructed only by using time delayed copies of a single time series, of a single observable dynamical variable of this system, meaning I only need one time series mapped to itself to reconstruct how my system moves through this space. <clears throat> 
And so one technique for analyzing this process is recurrence quantification analysis. So here on the left, you see that my space is no longer defined by different variables, but it's the same variable, the same time series uh, and its copy uh, with a time lag or with a tied uh, time uh, at a previous point, for instance, at the next point. And um, I can add more of these copies, uh, which our QA or this method allows us to do and quantify how the time series repeats themselves. And on the right, I have an example that tries to illustrate that. So I put these time series horizontally and vertically, and every time the number repeats, like you can see here in an image. So for instance, when my paper one is yellow as a particular measures of citations and diversity of um, uh, data used, then at point, uh, my paper 10 is similar. So I put a dot there, my paper 12 is similar. If I continue doing this with every paper and mapping it to itself, I could have a visual that quantifies the number of time the system revisits the same states within the phase space. So these uh, patterns of recurrence can be quantified and they are known in um, to describe something about how the system moves through the phase space. Is it stable? Is it predictable? Is it deterministic? Um, is it perturbed? Et cetera, et cetera. And so now I hope this introduction is sufficient that at some level you get a grasp of some of these ideas and then you can see how they can be translated into some specific applications of learning analytics research. So I pass uh, the word to my colleague uh, Liz here. Okay, hi everyone. Please give me a brief moment to share my screen. Okay, you should be seeing a slide deck now. All right, so let me begin um, by first introducing you to a publication I'll be talking about. It was just published a few weeks ago at the LEC conference called Exploring Confusion and Frustration as Nonlinear Dynamical Systems. And so this paper has one leading assumption is that emotions are multidimensional uh, in nature. And this was guided by the component process model developed by Cher in 2009. It ultimately states that emotion comprises of five subsystems. And these subsystems are described by cognitive. So thinking about the cognitive appraisals that learners may be making uh, regarding stimuli in their environment. Also the neurophysiological facet of an emotion. So thinking of the central nervous system, motivation components, the behaviors that might underlie an affective state, as well as the motor expressions and the subjective feeling. And that all of these subcomponents, these subsystems of the emotion are deeply interconnected, meaning that they are interacting constantly over time at a more macro level. And that based on this interaction, there may be synchronized uh, changes between either all or multiple components, and that based on this synchronization, it gives rise to a more macro level state, which we would come to know as an emotion. And so thinking about emotions within the context of learning, particularly within the context of digital learning environments, one of the most popular frameworks that's used to study emotions, some of us may be familiar with, is called the model of effective dynamics. And this model is based on the notion of cognitive disequilibrium that's coined by Jean Piaget. And so it ultimately states that a learner encounters a state when they encounter a state of uncertainty, when they're trying to assimilate new knowledge into their existing schema, uh, then they would engage into a state of cognitive disequilibrium. And the extent to which they can resolve that cognitive disequilibrium or regulate it back to a state of equilibrium would determine the extent to which that affective state is beneficial or detrimental to the learning process. So you can see here, a student is engaged with the material, they're, entered, they're in a state of cognitive equilibrium, but when they encounter that impasse or a state of uncertainty, they would transition to a state of disequilibrium. When they can transition or resolve that disequilibrium, they would transition back to a state of equilibrium. But if they're unable to resolve that state of disequilibrium, then they would transition to a state of frustration and boredom. And so based on these particular affective sequences, a lot of researchers have tested this empirically. And across the board, a lot of research find there's inconsistent results, particularly around transitions between confusion and frustration, so that sometimes these emotion categories are beneficial to learning, but other times they're detrimental. And so in this particular paper, we wanted to really examine examine variability that may underlie these different uh, uh, emotional categories and whether they impact learning and knowledge differently, particularly within the context of digital learning. And so for our specific study, we examined 
uh, referring back to that component process model, two components of an emotion. We looked at the motivation component by defining confused and, and frustrated behaviors and how they co-occurred with frustrated, uh, excuse me, facial expressions. So again, tapping into that motor expression. And so our leading research question for this paper was, are the frequency and the recurrence rate of facial expressions that co-occur during those confused and frustrated behaviors, is it associated with outcome measures? Outcome measures being learning and knowledge. And so in this study, we captured a sample of 74 sixth graders at a large public classroom in the United States, and the study lasted approximately seven days. So on the first day, students completed a pretest assessment of their knowledge. This was specific for climate change, which was the topic of study. Then on the next day, they completed a tutorial so they would learn how to, how to utilize the tools in the interactive digital learning environment called Betty's Brain. I'll touch on Betty's Brain just briefly on the next slide. And then they learned with Betty's Brain for approximately 50 minutes each day over the course of three days. And on the last day, they completed a post-test assessment. And so in terms of Betty's Brain, I want to touch on um, its interactive nature, which follows a teaching by learning paradigm. So students essentially enter this environment. They're asked to uh, learn about climate change by engaging with text and diagrams, then from engagement maps to teach Betty, the pedagogical agent on the top hand left side of the screen, about climate change by essentially uh, replicating their mental model. And then they can assess the accuracy of that concept map by referring to Mr. Davis, who provides information on um, which components may be accurate. And then they can take that information, that feedback, and revise those concept maps by either referring to the material again or simply providing new notes um, to connect to the, their concept map. And so based on the highly interactive nature of this environment, this is the information we use to classify whether or not they were confused or frustrated. So what we did is in a prior study, we used established classifiers that were trained using Bromp labels. So again, um, in an earlier study, researchers went into the classroom as students were learning with Betty's brain, and they essentially created labels of the amount of time uh, or the frequency at which students were confused or frustrated. I'm trying to say. Now, Bromt is actually a field observation protocol, so, so researchers can actually go directly into the classroom, label these uh, affective states. And so what we did is we took those labels, we mapped them on to students' interactions with Betty's brain, and then in this particular study, we created automated detectors of confusion and frustration. So uh, this is solely using students' interaction data. So at approximately every 20 seconds, we had a confidence rating of the likelihood that confusion was present or frustration was present. So during these confused and frustrated behaviors, we captured uh, students' facial expressions using AFDEX uh, automated facial recognition software. The software was designed using Paul Ekman's facial action coding system. So what we did is we captured those six emotions, facial expressions, based on a configuration of their muscular um, contractions over the course of the learning session. And so in order to examine the co-occurrence of those facial expressions as they code occurred with those frustrated or confused behaviors, we used a method that Sasha briefly talked about, recurrence quantification analysis. And again, this quantifies the number and the duration of recurrences that occurs within that phase space trajectory. So you can see here, I wanted to provide a brief example of the sort of variability we can get in examining the temporal structure of a time series. So for example, in this first plot here, uh, we can see the, the noise is quite random. Um, so there isn't a lot of recurrence. However, in the next plot, you can see the recurrence is quite periodic. In the third plot, we have sort of an autocorrelation. And then on the final plot, we have more of a chaotic recurrence. So we wanted to use this method to really look at the variability in that co-occurrence between our two emotion components. So what we did is we used auto recurrence quantification and multi-dimensional recurrence quantification. I want to unpack those just a little bit. Auto recurrence quantification deals with assessing the recurrence of a single time series. So in our particular example, during those frustrated moments, we captured their anger facial expressions. And so A and P here are used to denote the absence or presence of the facial expression. So in this analysis, we can capture patterns at which that presence of facial expression were recurring over time during confusion. And then similarly for multi-dimensional recurrence, 
This method allows us to assess more than two time series so that we can capture sort of system level regularity across all of those facial expressions of emotions, as you can see during those confused behaviors. So we can capture sort of the recurrence rate of more collective patterns across all the motor expressions that a student may be expressing. And so through this methodology, we can capture recurrence rate metrics. So how often is that emotion repeating such that we get the historical information of, of how often it's recurring in that particular state? We also have determinism. So how predictable is that recurrence over time? And then finally entropy. So this is a measure of how chaotic or organized that recurrence structure is. And so again, we wanted to look at these metrics in relation to learning outcomes. So we ran Spearman correlations. Our first assessment looked at confusion, frustration, and the co-occurrence of facial expressions. For our auto RQA, so again, looking at that single time series, we found a significant positive relationship between the determinism of sadness co-occurring with confusion. So what that means is that recurrence rate recurringly returning to a state of sadness co-occurring with confusion, it recurred predictably. So it was quite regular during the learning session and that this regularity was associated, was actually beneficial for learning. We couldn't interpret this as a student is continuously encountering that state of uncertainty. Again, they're confused. They're in a state of cognitive disequilibrium. If that's happening repeatedly, perhaps they are a bit disappointed in their performance based on their uh, facial expressions of sadness. So if this is recurring repeatedly, the student may be disappointed, but they could be pushing them to persevere. Um, and it could eventually be beneficial for the learning process and learning game. However, when we looked at the multidimensional measures, so those collective measures of regularity, we didn't find any significant relationships with our outcome measures. Now, transitioning to frustrated behaviors and the co-occurrence of facial expressions, for our RQA, auto RQA, we found a significant relationship where students who came in with more prior knowledge to the session was associated with more recurrence rate of disgust and more predictive recurrence of disgust, denoted by that determinism associated with um, uh, prior knowledge with the co-occurrence of frustration. So again, the more often that discussed, recurred, and co-occurred with frustrated behaviors was associated with the student having more prior knowledge, but the less prior knowledge the student has was associated with more frequency of discussed co-occurring with frustration. Now it's important to distinguish frequency from recurrence because frequency doesn't account for the historical variation. So a student has more prior knowledge, they may be experiencing more discussed co-occurring frustration if they had more expectations about performing well during the session. But if they weren't performing well, for example, they're recurringly and regularly experiencing bouts of frustration, they're stuck, they're not able to overcome that cognitive disequilibrium, they may be disappointed or in, in facially expressing that as discussed because they're not meeting up to their expectation because they have a higher prior knowledge. Um, however, if they're not having recurring bouts of that, they could just be occurring occasionally. And so it wouldn't be, uh, maybe they didn't have as much prior knowledge or expectations about how they would perform. Now, when we look at its relation to learning game, we found a significant negative relationship between the determinism, so that recurring, regularly recurring bouts of disgust with frustration was negatively associated with learning gains. In contrast to that, that frequency of disgust co-occurring with frustration was positively related to learning gain. I think this is really important to distinguish and take note of because the determinism would indicate there's a recurring bout of disgust with frustration that could indicate a regulatory problem if it's continuously and regularly recurring. And again, that regulatory problem might indicate they're not able to regulate that cognitive impasse and they might be stuck, which would be detrimental to their learning process. In contrast to that, if it's just a frequency of discuss co-occurring with frustration, there wouldn't be a historical pattern of recurrence there. So again, that might not be a regulatory problem and was actually beneficial for their learning game of the information. So what can we take away from this? Sorry, we also didn't have relationships with that collective measure here. But an important key takeaway from this is that confusion and frustration demonstrate a great deal of variability with how they co-occurred with facial expressions. And that this variability within these emotion categories had a different relationship with knowledge and learning outcomes. And that this could be due to differences in emotion regulation skills, differences in motivation, or even prior knowledge as we saw. And that recurrence quantification could provide really valuable insight to dis into discovering those regulatory patterns that may occur within one or multiple emotion components. However, this study is not without limitations. We should keep this in consideration is that our facial expressions were again aligned with those interaction-based detectors, which captured frustrated and confused behaviors every 20 seconds. So we actually took a weighted average of continuous dynamics of those facial expressions to align them with our 20-second interval measure of behavior. 
Um, so we could be missing some dynamics within that at weighted average. Also, our detectors had an AUC RSC of 0 0.56, 0 0.63, so we could have missed some confused, frustrated behaviors, but it was uh, did perform above chance. And again, facial recognition algorithms may present some measurement errors because they're solely trained on adult male faces. And again, we captured six graders in the study. Uh, that concludes my example. I will pass uh, the puck to Yelena. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, just give me a second to start the slides. And of course, to share them with you. Okay, I hope uh, you see the slides now. Okay, uh, I will now present uh, the second example, which is about uh, profiles of change in learning behavior. And uh, as Sasha mentioned in the beginning, this example is actually based on the paper that uh, Sasha Bellardo and I had uh, at uh, last year's LAC, so LAC 23. And the title of the paper is Students' Profile of Change in a, in a University Course, uh, uh, com sorry, Complex uh, Dynamical Systems uh, Perspective. I haven't seen my screen. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, of course, by drawing uh, on the CDS theory, we started uh, with the assumption that a system that is student in our case uh, generally exhibits uh, stable behavioral patterns, that is, stable recurrence of learning states. However, this stability in behavioral patterns is occasionally disrupted, uh, and it is typ typically disrupted, uh, disrupted by external factors that uh, tend to lead to increased variability in the system's behavior. And uh, such a disruption or destabilization can indicate a phase transition, so the one that Sasha was talking about, associated to qualitative change in the system's behavior. In other words, if a student switches uh, from a more orderly to a less orderly behavior, we can expect that the qualitative change in behavior will take place, or in CDS terms, the system transitions to another phase. For example, uh, in cognitive science research, it has been demonstrated that uh, in the context of cognitive development, uh, such a disruption can move a learner from one developmental phase, such as not being able to solve a problem, to another developmental phase, such as uh, being able to find a solution. And then the question is uh, how to identify changes in the level of orderliness in the system behavior, that is how to identify these phase transitions. And uh, one uh, option is to do so is to use Shannon entropy, uh, which has uh, actually been uh, widely used uh, to estimate how stable a system is. Uh, more precisely, Shannon's entropy has been used to quantify the level of disorder in time series descriptive of a system behavior. And peaks in entropy would reflect the destabilization of the current state and the signal and upcoming change. And uh, with those starting uh, assumptions, uh, we set the following uh, study objectives. Uh, first, we wanted to identify patterns of phase transitions in the learning process of each student. That is, uh, uh, to identify patterns of change in student recurrent behavior within a course. And then uh, we also wanted to examine if students with similar patterns of change, in other words, with similar dynamics indicators, are also similar in terms of their course performance and their self-reported learning behavior. Uh, so the study context uh, was an undergraduate uh, engineering course uh, with a flipped classroom design. Uh, the, uh, the course was uh, 13 weeks long uh, and it had a weekly structure in the sense that there was a distinct topic studied in each week. And as I said, uh, it had this uh, flipped classroom, um, let's say, design. Uh, where the online part of the course included various kinds of uh, learning activities that were available to students to prepare for the face-to-face -face part of the course. And those included uh, watching videos, reading course materials, doing multiple choice quizzes, which served as formative assessment, or doing exercises, uh, which served as summative assessment. And uh, we had uh, traced data uh, for 288 students. And after some cleaning and transformation, we actually had the event logs uh, of the format given here. So event ID, student ID, learning action, where learning action is one of these that I have just mentioned, and the timestamp. Uh, 
And regarding the study method uh, for our first objective, namely to identify patterns of change in student recurrent behavior, we used the uh, ARQA, that is auto RQA that uh, Liz talked about, uh, with categorical time series that were derived from log learning events. And I'll explain in a moment uh, how we did that. Uh, and uh, we did this uh, ARQA for each student uh, individually and for each week of the course. That is for each student in each week of the course. Uh, so regarding uh, uh, this uh, time series that was required for um, ARQA, uh, so we mapped uh, actually a log learning events uh, into coarse-grained uh, uh, categories of learning actions that correspond to different types of SRL behavior. Uh, more specifically, we adopted a sociocognitive theoretical perspective to SRL, uh, self-regulated learning, uh, with an understanding that the student goes uh, through a sequence of learning behaviors, that is in CDS terminology learning states, uh, which include uh, observing something in a social, pa social pain uh, through video re uh, readings, internalizing it through practicing and evaluating the effectiveness through performing and adapting it. And accordingly, uh, we recorded learning uh, uh, events, that is actions uh, in learning events uh, into four uh, categories, planning, observing, practicing, and performing. So planning was everything related to the access to the course schedule and to the learning objectives, which are available for each week of the course, and also to the dashboard that was available uh, to students for reflection. Uh, then uh, observing was uh, everything related to the interaction with uh, video and reading materials. Uh, practicing was about interaction in multiple choice quizzes as a form of formative assessment. And performing was about interaction with exercises, which primarily served as summative assessment. And in that way, we actually uh, mapped uh, uh, logged events uh, into uh, this kind of sequence of uh, these four uh, categories of uh, learning actions. And this was done, as I said, uh, for, uh, for each student and for each uh, course week. Uh, so uh, having done uh, this uh, mapping, uh, then uh, we use uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, categorical time series as, uh, the, uh, as the input uh, to ARQA and got uh, recurrence plot uh, as the output. And then based on the re recurrence plot, uh, we computed uh, entropy as an indicator of destabilization. Regarding recurrence plot, we do not have time to explain it here, but in the paper, you can uh, take uh, a nice explanation is uh, given. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, regarding the, the second research objective, so uh, the detection of uh, profiles of change, uh, so we started with uh, from these uh, computations of entropy for each student in each week. And uh, in that way, for each student, we got a kind of uh, sequence of uh, entropy values um, uh, for the uh, 12 weeks. So from week uh, two to week 13, uh, we didn't uh, do it for the week one because that was uh, the prepara uh, prep preparatory week for the course and uh, no real uh, learning was happening. Uh, so in that way, we got a temporal profile of destabilization for uh, each student. And um, uh, starting from that, uh, we actually did a kind of clustering of uh, students uh, using a method which is called latent gro uh, class growth curve modeling, or, uh, or LCGM for short, uh, which actually um, combines uh, latent class analysis and growth curve modeling in the sense that uh, for each student, uh, we first estimate uh, a growth curve uh, uh, based on the measurements uh, of entropy values uh, for individual weeks. Uh, and then we cluster students based on the estimated growth curve parameters. And in that way, uh, we actually uh, managed to identify latent groups of students with similar temporal profiles of destabilization within the course. And we did this LCGM uh, for different numbers of classes or clusters and uh, got uh, the best model for uh, free classes. And this is the one that uh, we kept and further analyzed. Uh, to do this analysis uh, and interpretation of, of the profiles, uh, we started from this plot. Uh, this is a plot uh, with means and standard errors of weekly entropy measures for each uh, latent class or each profile. Uh, it says here normalized entropy. Normalized means just that it's in the uh, scope of um, one range of one to, uh, zero to one. Uh, so uh, regarding uh, the profiles, uh, the first one uh, is students with uh, stable weekly study patterns. So this is uh, the green one, green one. 
and uh, it was also the largest one with 158 uh, students. So it gathers uh, students whose entropy of recurrence in weekly activities remained fairly stable and relatively high throughout the course. Uh, the only drops uh, happened in uh, week six and week 13, which were the weeks of midterm and final exams. Uh, and we assume that uh, intensive preparation for the exam actually reduced the variability of behavior uh, to uh, exercises and uh, quizzes. Actually not assumed, just but uh, checked it in the data. Uh, the second profile is uh, about students with steep changes in weekly study patterns. So this is the orange one. And this is the smallest uh, uh, profile with 40 students. And uh, we can see that uh, this is the profile that uh, starts uh, with the highest entropy values, but already uh, from the very beginning, uh, those entropy values uh, start going down uh, and steadily go down uh, with some uh, uh, significant drops, especially between weeks seven and eight. Uh, and uh, we uh, assume that these are uh, students uh, who continuously and occasionally significantly change their behavior towards uh, less diverse ones. And uh, also this profile actually exhibited uh, the, I mean, showed uh, the lowest exam scores, both on midterm and final exams, uh, and significantly lower compared to the other two profiles. Uh, and the third profile includes students with uh, moderate changes uh, in weekly study patterns. So uh, those are the students who started, uh, uh, so the, the violet one. Uh, so uh, students who start with lowest entropy, uh, that is high stability of recurrence uh, in behavior, and experienced a slight decrease uh, throughout the course, only uh, with a significant decrease uh, towards the very end uh, of the course. So we suppose that these are the students who uh, found study strategy that work well for them. Uh, and uh, without much change in behavioral patterns, they achieve exam performance comparable uh, to profile one. Uh, as I mentioned, the second profile has significantly lower comp uh, performance compared to the other two, both in midterm and final exams, whereas the other two profiles uh, were comparable in their exam performances. Uh, we have also compared these profiles in terms of their self-reported measures of SRL and uh, study behavior, uh, which were collected before the course uh, through MS, uh, MSLQ and the study process questionnaire, but uh, no statistically significant difference uh, was found uh, among the profiles, uh, so we assume that uh, these surveys uh, and our uh, actually method measure different uh, things. So also, of course, uh, this study, as any other, suffers from uh, some limitations. Uh, first, the methodology we adopted uh, has not been widely applied in learning environments of the type we examine and with log type uh, log data, uh, sorry, uh, collected in such a context, uh, meaning that uh, we did not have uh, a clear guidance uh, for some analytical decisions that we needed to make. And therefore, the choices uh, we made uh, might not be the optimal ones. Uh, for example, the choice regarding granularity of uh, log data uh, we use categories of learning actions, as I mentioned, but maybe uh, more granular learning actions would work better. Uh, also, uh, regarding temporal unit of analysis, we relied on course weeks uh, since uh, the, the course had that weekly structure. But again, maybe more granular um, analysis at the level of learning sessions uh, would provide further information. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also need to highlight that uh, in our method, the uh, RQA and the entropy measures uh, capture actually the pattern of recurrence in the system behavior, but offer very little in terms of meaning, that is the semantics of uh, learning states that the system goes through. Or in other words, RQA results are based solely on, on the recurrence of distinct states, but not on the semantics of uh, those states. And uh, therefore, to, uh, to be able to better interpret the dynamics of the learning process and to understand the phases that it goes through, uh, the current analysis uh, may benefit from a complementary one uh, that would be based on a time series that captures the information processing aspect of distinct learning states, uh, such as the cognitive load of students, skills required, pro uh, uh, cognitive processing required, and similar things. And it's something to be done further. So I'll stop here and uh, uh, hand it over to Sasha. The, the only thing is that, Sasha, do you want me to continue or how do we go? Yep. Yes, if you could just uh, move to the slide that sits under mm -hmm. the implications. 
up the next slide. So we have two minutes to wrap this up so that you can have a little bit of a chance to ask a question. So I want to go back to the beginning saying that uh, we tried to highlight one example of thinking about learning and the uh, specific empirical work surrounding it. But there are a lot of questions and we hope that this can serve as an inspiration where you can basically take these ideas and develop them further. So first, transferability. Does any of this uh, that comes from biology and physics and social science, does it transfer to learning systems and learning data? There is no clear answer to that question at the moment. Um, but it offers some implications for um, how to use time. It doesn't destroy the structure of time, which is what we were trying to show. Uh, it helps us start thinking, well, is there a pattern to the process we're talking about? And when we are capturing process already with existing learning analytics method, are we capturing this process at a micro or a macro level, really, despite of the claims we're making already? Um, another thing we wanted to make clear is just because these two studies talk about RQA, it's not just a method and it's just one of the methods. Uh, there are other examples of empirical work using these kind of uh, ideas um, that potentially we can think better about the types of phases that can exist in learning systems. And that although two examples we have are data-driven phases, the work presented at the workshop last month for, coming from Roger Azevedo uh, lab by uh, Megan uh, shows an example of how you can start think have theory-driven thought around the phases. And of course, when we base this phase space uh, portrait and talk about the different trajectories, individual variability becomes important and the work that's already been done in learning analytics around ideographic approaches makes sense. So I'm gonna stop here and thank uh, my colleagues and the colleagues that we had the workshop with, it's in the next slide. And also thank the uh, template uh, slide go folks whose template we used to prepare the slides. And questions now, I think that's um Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jelena, uh, Sasha, and uh, Elizabeth for this uh, great presentation. As uh, she said, we don't have much time, but do we have uh, some questions out there? I think we already have one question in the chat by Annie Fins to Jelena. Why did you administer the measures of self regulated learning at the beginning of the course and not at the end? This would more likely reflect intentions of students when measured at the end of the course or the semester. They would like to be more retros re retrospective of their actual behaviors over the course of the semester. Yelena, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, the, the, uh, the response would be very simple. It is not we who actually collected data. The data was something that, that already existed from before. Actually, the data that we used in our previous studies and this was uh, another way of looking uh, at the same data. And uh, the question will probably go to Abelardo, uh, since he's the one who collected data uh, now a couple of years ago. But yeah, I fully, fully uh, realize uh, the I, I understand the question, and it fully makes sense. But uh, I, it really this decision predates uh, my involvement with this data set, so I cannot respond to it. Yeah, great. Uh, any other questions, insights? Maybe to Elizabeth, I was wondering about, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating about the emotional uh, research, like the affect. I was wondering from your experience, like doing research on uh, affect and the, what's the kind of uh, best kind of window in studying these kind of uh, states? Because I'm wondering about like, if you have like a timed, a certain kind of window, you feel like you can reliably get emotional states for students when they are learning in a class. And I'm look. I'm talking about this, for example, if you are looking into studies that uh, that take some time, for example, versus a kind of a limited laboratory kind of a setting, because emotions vary and like variate over time. I don't know whether you have thought about this in your research. A little bit. Um, most of the work we do is in the laboratory, but this study was in the classroom. Um, and I also think it's important to think about the topic of study too. Like, for example, is it emotional or you know would you expect a lot of variability um also what's the sample like demographic background um and like terms of expression and, and how might that play a role and how you would capture it so i think there's a lot of variables there in determining the window um 
But time is definitely something to think about, especially given that these are short one hour, typically 50 minute based sessions, mm. um, something we're looking into, but don't have a clear answer on yet. Rogers, I wish, but <laughs> I understand. But I mean, it's it is so very interesting. And I think even with the within the short period of time, I think there is a lot of uh, insights to gain there. Any other questions from the audience? You can unmute if you want to. There's a question from Phil. Uh, do you want to just say out your question briefly? Ali, I'll just read it. It says that information in mind is the trigger for an emotion or a learner's choice to engage with the system using a particular tool. So instead of focusing on emotion states or process tool selection events, what happens if the information displayed at those times is contrasted to specific inf information identified as prior knowledge? By the, I mean here an item class, like a prior item about a principle or a prior item asking to translate a verbal description into a symbolic expression. If that kind of information is subject to RQA, could you then predict by analyzing the content when a learner experiences an emotion or chooses a tool, would that added information suffice to account for individual variability? That's interesting, Phil. That's something certainly to look at for sure. Um, we're actually doing a bit with game mechanics, so different kinds of game mechanics, which are designed to elicit different emotions um, in, a, in a future study. Um, but thank you for that. That would be interesting to include potentially in the uh, different variables that we're modeling here, because that could provide insight into cognitive appraisals, for example, that dimension. Yeah. And get it, at that it aspect. Start, it Picking out that model, it's the cognitive appraisal that leads to everything else. And yeah. to identify what's what the appraisal is, it might be helpful to know what the information in the presentation at the point in time is as a differential compared to the prior knowledge the person has. That's very granular, that part. Yeah, absolutely. So, we need Sasha, yeah. Yeah. Sasha yeah. had a point. Yeah. I yes, I just I wanted to add quickly that uh, I, I think that that's key, but it's key for asking a lot of questions that are not the kinds that we framed in the beginning, right? So you can ask two sets of questions, or at least that's my understanding of it. We can start asking, is there a pattern to the process and what's that pattern? And then we can start asking why we're observing the pattern we're observing. And theoretically speaking, determining a pattern does not require the right variable uh, because we can still understand the dynamics of what's happening and start looking for things. However, if we want to start understanding sort of relationships between the different processes, then we have to go back to the theory. And uh, that's also what we've discussed with Yelena, that in our example, obviously, if it's building on theory that uses information processing and it's not in the picture, we cannot explain what we're seeing because it's just not there. And yes, I think what you're suggesting, even looking looking at that in relation to behavior would m might make some suggestions as to what's happening. But again, RQA itself, in my view, without... As, as it's presented, been presenting in the studies, will always only tell us about the pattern rather than um, a little bit more. We need to do a little bit more with that to start asking the kind of questions um, yeah. that explain Thank things. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Just... Yeah. sorry, I thought you had Thank you. finished. Okay, uh, I think we have we had more questions in the chat. I think you can say uh, Joel was asking whether uh, the, uh, emotions could vary based on uh, age which could be uh, similar like what happens in marketing applications and as to whether it would be interesting to see if there are differences in emotional provocative course content versus more dry course content. For example, if you are teaching science or biology, maybe students are emotionally more like uh, provocated than teaching very serious things. And so whether that could actually change. So that's about disciplinary content and how that varies with emotions and whether it's the same, whether it varies between content do you have any last uh, comment about that, Elizabeth? That's interesting because um, I certainly think it would vary by discipline and uh, the, in terms of based on the uh, degree of interaction with the environment. So is it a textbook? Is it a game they're playing? We could we would certainly see differences in um, the emotional um, processes that might emerge. Um, in terms of variability in, I think you said group, uh, racial group and age. Am I reading the right question? I'm not sure. 
Um, but facial recognition would definitely present some measurement errors and bias there since they're predominantly trained on a single demographic group. Um, so utilizing algorithmic bias um, sort of evaluation measures, I think would be a good next step forward to really answer that question. Um, did I get right at that, Rogers? Yeah, I mean, we have very think, limited uh, time here. Yeah, I think you got it. Uh, yeah, and we are really very sorry. I think we have to end this. We are sorry we have four minutes above like, uh, the time, but I think we can continue this discussion later. And I just want to say a very big thank you again to our presenters, Sasha, uh, Jelena, and Elizabeth for a great presentation. And a big thank you to all of you joining us today. So we enjoyed the discussion and hope the session inspired you. We'll announce more details about our next webinar in the Solar Newsletter and through our social media. Feel free to subscribe to the Solar Newsletter through the website. And of course, feel free to tell a friend or colleague about the webinar. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you in a future webinar. Bye-bye.